Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. I was thinking today would be a great day to do a vegetable garden tour because here we are in the first week of September. How in the world did that happen already? It seems like things have been creeping along slowly because of the pandemic and then all of a sudden whammo, here we are at the end of the season. Now before we get started, I wanted to point out this sign. You probably have seen it in the intros to each of my videos. My mom made me this sign years ago and I just love it. It initially just had the words peas and quiet and then I added on the artwork a little bit later. But this makes me think of her every single time. She was a great gardener and I'm sure she was one of the big influences in my life for growing a garden every year. So let's get started on the tour. So as I mentioned, here we are in September. And you know, this time of year, the garden does not look so pristine and pretty. It's going to look a little ragged in places and that's just how it should be this time of year. In the first bed that you see in the background, that was the onion bed. We have harvested all of the onions and we're drying them in a shed. In the next bed that has the floating row cover on it, that's where the Swiss chard and beets are growing. They're both doing well and once again, I keep the row cover on them to keep leaf miner flies from laying eggs on the leaves because their offspring can cause so much trouble. In the bed on the right is where the carrots and parsnips are growing. We're just letting them grow until they get hit by a good hard frost, which will make the roots even sweeter. And then the next bed is where I replanted lettuce and sorrel you can see that I've thinned the seedlings and they're doing pretty well. I also had a few gaps, so yesterday I reseeded a few of those spots so I can get a nice stand of lettuce and soil. This is the rutabaga bed and look at these poor leaves. Now, you know, sometimes as a gardener, it can be hard to troubleshoot what is causing damage to either leaves or the roots of a plant, or flowers, or the fruits. In this case, I know exactly why these leaves look so atrocious. It's because the quail decided, gee, those leaves are pretty tasty. They've been standing on this bed and just ripping away at them. And, you know, it doesn't look so good, but I think the plants are going to be okay. You can see the rutabagas are a really good size, and there's also kohlrabi down the middle. It's being slow to bulb up, and I don't really know why, but I'm just going to let it keep growing. And these also I will not harvest until there is a good hard frost, because that will make these bulbs even sweeter. So that's nice. I've also been having some problems with aphids on here and cabbage worms and so I did spray some Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis to take care of the cabbage worms and I also hosed these off before spraying the Bt to knock the aphids off. So other than the quail damage they really don't look too bad. <laughs> In the next bed only half of it's planted. Those beautiful yellow flowers are big duck yellow marigolds. They are amazing. I love them. This is the second year I've started them from seed, and I heartily recommend them. And then to the right are some cabbage heads, and you'll notice there's some holes in the leaves. So you'll recall that I've been writing a book called The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. And sadly, because I needed some photos, I've been having to kind of plant some sacrificial beds and let the insects do their thing so I can take pictures to let you know what the damage looks like so you can narrow down who the culprit is and then determine what kind of organic method you can use to control them. Fortunately, with cabbage, the damage is on the outer leaves and so it really shouldn't be a problem with the quality of the actual head of cabbage. And there, a cabbage butterfly just flew by there. That is the adult form of the cabbage worm. Er. In this final bed of the first row, I've got young carrots growing and turnips. The turnips are those leafy crops you see in the background and they are doing beautifully. There should be plenty of time for them to produce nice bulbs. The carrots are an experiment for me. 
I don't know if I can get even just small carrots before the winter gets really cold, but I'm willing to try. And I just thinned out the seedlings yesterday so they are nicely spaced. I should also mention that there's netting on this bed and that's just to keep those pesky quail away from the young seedlings. Once they're large enough to fend for themselves, that bird netting will come off. Okay, we're heading into Tomato Central and you'll notice we've got three different tomato plants that are in really large containers and this was a great way for us to expand the footprint of our garden because I always run out of room. So let me explain what we're growing here. These are Solano. It's a grape type of a tomato, extremely prolific. This one is an early tomato called Resilience, also very prolific. And this one is Yellow Apple. It's an unusual shape, kind of a medium sized tomato, is also growing really well. In these three raised beds, I'm growing tomatoes and you'll notice there's a lot of colorful tomatoes. That's a very good sign. This year has been really challenging for a lot of areas of the country. I'm hearing from so many readers and followers on social media that they just can't get their tomatoes to ripen. So I've been talking in recent videos about my three-step process to get tomatoes to ripen by the end of the season, or at least the majority of them. So I wanted to talk about that briefly today because it's time for the third step. Now, since I'm feeling pretty proud of these orange tomatoes, I thought this is the perfect place to talk about my three-step pruning routine. Now you're looking at Chef's Choice Orange. They are a fantastic slicing tomato. They make the best tomato sandwich ever. And I have been growing them for years. I'm not willing to try any other slicing tomatoes because this is the one for me. But let's talk about the pruning routine that I go through just as a recap. About six weeks before our first anticipated frost, what I do is I cut back all of the tall, rangy growth that has maybe some little blossoms on it, maybe some teeny tiny tomatoes, but mostly it's just leaves. I know that there's no way those flowers will ripen by the end of the season, so I trim them back and I do it on all of the plants. The second step involves doing more of that pruning and also cutting back on the water to the beds by about 50%. I know that's kind of tricky to do, but what you're doing is you're trying to stress the plants which will force them to ripen those green tomatoes. Today we're talking about the third and final step. So let's go over that real quickly. This is one of my paste tomatoes. It's actually Gilberti, which I grew last year. What I did yesterday for the third step is I cut each tomato plant back just above any tomatoes that I think will make it by the end of the season and mature by the end of the season. So I went through and I did that. I also removed any branches of leaves that were covering tomatoes so that they get more sunlight because that will help them ripen. And then the third step I did, which is always painful, is I completely turned off the water to my tomato beds, again to stress them so that they will ripen these tomatoes by the end of the season. Now what if some of your tomatoes just won't ripen and now you see that you're going to get a frost? I don't want you to worry because you can still get them to ripen. What you want to do is pick all of the tomatoes that are mature size or darn close to it, take them indoors, and what you're going to do is place them on a sheet of newspaper with an inch or two in between, and that's just in case one of them rots, it's not going to impact the tomato right next to it. And then you're going to cover those tomatoes with another sheet of newspaper. So you want to keep them in the dark. And it's amazing. It doesn't seem like it would work, but they will ripen. So all is not lost if you suddenly notice that there's a frost coming. Pick those tomatoes because, you know, the plants are very tender and they will not like a frost one bit and it will ruin the tomatoes. Now here is a happy sight. This is my cantaloupe bed. I'm growing Tuscan Napoli. You'll notice the color. They have been turning color, which means they're ripe or darn close. 
And you'll also recall that this bed got off to a horrible start, so I'm pretty tickled. I've got 10 melons all together, or at least I had 10 melons. We harvested one the other day and ate it, and it was fabulous. But I do get a lot of questions about knowing when to pick a melon. And so there's three things you're going to look for. One is that the stem is pulling away from the melon. Or maybe I should say the melon is pulling away from the stem, but you'll notice it'll be just about hanging by a thread. That's an excellent sign. Also, the fact that they have turned to this lovely peachy color instead of green, that's another sign. And also, if you happen to see some yellow jackets or wasps buzzing about them, that means they can smell how sweet it is inside and they are definitely getting ripe. This is the pumpkin bed and you can see they're continuing to mature into that gorgeous orange color. Now I do get a lot of questions about knowing when to pick them as well as winter squash and the answer is exactly the same so that's nice. What you do is the thumbnail test. You try to press your thumbnail into the skin of the pumpkin or winter squash. If your thumbnail cuts through the skin easily, it's not mature, just leave it alone and let it keep growing. But if you can't pierce the skin with your thumbnail, that means it's ripe. When you harvest it, leave a couple of inches of stem attached. And that's because if you knock off the stem or trim it off, the area where the pumpkin attached to the vine with that stem is a spot that can get mold and so you don't want that. Now if you accidentally knock the stem off don't worry about it just use it first in cooking. But there's one more thing you need to do and it is so important and very easy. Once you've harvested your pumpkins and winter squash move them to a sunny warm but protected from the weather area and leave them there for two weeks. What will happen is they will basically harden off and they'll keep longer in storage than you thought possible. This is my winter squash and cucumber arbor. We made it with cattle panels or livestock panels. And you know, I had envisioned they would be completely over the top and me having to watch where I walked because I was going to hit my head on all of these squash. Well, that didn't exactly happen. And I think it's because this arbor is in an area that does get a little more shade in the morning than I'd like. So we're going to move it next year to a sunnier spot to see how they do. But you can see I've got a kusha squash here. And you're probably noticing this netting here. This is one of those produce bags. And I was just really nervous that it might be too heavy and break off of the vine. And that would be awful. So I have put a bag over it and tied it to the support just to be on the safe side. But what you can see also, if I look closely, okay, right here. So these ones are called autumn frost. It's a small kind of a butternut style squash. Very excited about those. This is the first year I've grown them. In the back here you see these orange squash. These are poti marron. That's another new one for this year. And there's also some other types of winter squash growing in here. And then I also have cucumbers here and here. You'll recall that my husband Bill is an awesome pepper grower and so you can see different types of sweet and hot peppers in here. They are in the little hoop house that we made quite a few years ago it's over a couple of our raised beds. And Bill has been picking like crazy. It's amazing how many peppers he gets out of this little space. Next up are the Claremore summer squash which are growing in the front here. They have been producing like crazy. And then this goofy vine here is where we're growing trombone zucchini. You can see how long this is. And those have not been as productive this year as they have in years past, but we really enjoy them a lot. I'm growing cover crops in these next two beds. It's a combination of buckwheat, winter peas, and rye. And this is to enrich the soil with all sorts of great nutrients so that the soil is in good shape for next year.
Here's my pole bean arbor where I'm growing musica pole beans. And you know, they started off a little slowly and all of a sudden every other day I get a huge bowl of beans, which I'm mostly blanching and freezing so we can use it through the fall and winter months. But we're also having them with dinner and uh, I'm ready to say stop already. <laughs> but a bunch of these look really good and I'm going to take a nice load of them to the food bank. In front of them I've got more of those big duck yellow marigolds. I've got celery plants and I'm about to the point where I'm going to pick a bunch of the stalks, chop them up and freeze them as well because they make a great addition to soups and stews. There's also some basil plants in here and anytime I see a flower bud on there I just nip it off and the best part uh, is that it smells so good. So we've been using these for cooking, we'll make some pesto and they make such a great addition to the menu. This is the south side of the bean arbor and you'll notice these plants, these are leeks and they're Bulgarian giant and I would have to agree with the name because they are bigger than ones I've grown in the past. There's also a row of onions that I really need to harvest and then these four containers, well actually there's a fifth down there by the raspberries, are all growing potatoes. This was another great way to expand the footprint of our garden because we ran out of beds but I wanted to have lots of potatoes. So I'll be real excited to harvest them and I'll make sure you see the harvest too. Now since I've been talking a little bit about harvesting, you might be wondering when to harvest potatoes, especially if this is your first year of growing them. And what you want to do is let all of the foliage get frosted this fall and then it's a good time to harvest them. Now when they bloom during the summer months, that usually means that you can sneak a few new potatoes from underneath without disturbing the whole plant. So that's okay. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, sometimes when a plant blooms, there will be tiny little seed pods. They look kind of like little potatoes on the potato plants. Do not harvest them and eat them because they are poisonous. I just thought you might like to know that. So either clip them off or just plain leave them alone, but don't use them for any cooking. You'll recall that I said at the beginning of this video, the garden does not look so great at this time of year. Well, here's a perfect example. This is our corn patch in those two beds. And you might remember that we had a very early harvest of corn. I don't know why. We were finished by the first week in August, which is very unusual. But we're not complaining because we got a great harvest. Now ordinarily I would cut the stalks down and shred them up and put them in the compost pile. But again, since I've been working on this book and trying to get photos of certain kinds of vegetable garden pests, such as the corn earworm moth, I decided to leave them in place in the hopes it would still lure them in because they become active in September. So I haven't seen any corn earworm moths yet, but that's why they're still left in their beds and looking pretty sad. Under this netting is my broccoli patch and it has not been a success story. Usually I grow early dividend broccoli which is a wonderful variety. It is very productive and I just love it. Well, I decided to try Millennium this year and what happened is it produced kind of medium sized primary heads of broccoli which I harvested it has not produced any side shoots at all, which is very unusual and very disappointing. So sad to say I'm not going to be growing that one again next year because it really was disappointing. Well, we finally made it to the last bed in the garden and that's where I'm growing melons. This is lambkin melon and I'm also growing ha ogan honeydew, which is at the other end of the bed. These are all doing really well and there's a lot of yellow jackets in here so that's telling me they're just about ripe. The main thing I'm watching at this point is the stem where the melon attaches to the vine because as they start loosening their grip on them 
that means they're ripe. Okay, we finally made it through the whole garden and it's starting to get pretty hot, so I'm about ready to head indoors. You know, I love looking at how a garden transforms over a season, and I hope that you have enjoyed these tours too because it's amazing how much things grow and produce. And sometimes things don't go so well, but that's all part of gardening. There's always next year. Now, as I've mentioned, I have a book coming out. It's going to be available in April. It's called The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook from Cool Springs Press. And you can already pre-order it on Amazon, so be sure to get your copy. I'll keep you posted on that. And I really appreciate your watching today. I hope you found it interesting. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.